All right, buckle up for this one, guys. My name's Al Horner, and you're listening to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, an acclaimed screenwriter revisits their first draft of what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. Today on the show, I'm overjoyed to be joined by the very talented Hussein Amini, writer of the brutal and beautiful 2011 cult smash, Drive, directed by Nicholas Winden Refn. Based on the 2004 James Salas novel of the same name, Drive told the story of a stuntman by day, getaway driver by night, whose dual lives collide after he strikes up a friendship with his neighbor, Irene. From there, Hussein's screenplay submerged audiences in a dangerous, hyper-stylized LA criminal underworld, strapping viewers in the passenger seat next to a captivatingly unknowable protagonist, simply named The Driver, played by Ryan Gosling. If you've read the novel, you'll know that Hussein had quite a task taking the lyrical, very interior prose and plot of the book and translating it into a movie. Luckily, the Iranian-born storyteller is a bit of a master when it comes to adaptation. From 1997's The Wings of the Dove to his 2014 directorial debut, The Two Faces of January, Hussein really relishes taking a story from page to screen, adding a subtle sprinkle of his personality and his past to the recipe along the way. Across an engrossing conversation, Hussein and I discuss how Drive is deep down a fairy tale. We talk about what the film expresses about our culture of violence, why an early draft of the film featured the death of Irene, and how his storytelling habits were shaped by a childhood spent in the shadow of his parents' divorce and the Iranian Revolution. We also get into the meaning of the driver's scorpion jacket, how the film's iconic elevator sequence came to be, and Hoss's dark, gritty vision for the upcoming Obi-Wan Kenobi TV series that he worked on briefly before stepping away from the project. It's a gripping conversation, Hoss is a wonderful guest, so yeah, I really hope you enjoy this one. Before we dive in, a quick reminder that if you like what we do and want to help the show continue to grow, Script Apart is now on Patreon. Yes, for the price of a single monthly cup of coffee, you can now get ad-free episodes, early access to episodes, and upcoming bonus content. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart if you'd like to get involved there. Okay, that's the admin out of the way. Let's get into it, shall we? This is the incredible Hussein Amini talking about the first draft secrets of Drive. A huge thank you as ever to our Patreon supporters, that includes John Crozier and Smith Glover. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey, Hussein, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Brilliant. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm going to start off with an all-important question, Hoss. With Drive, you of course wrote one of the all-time definitive car movies up there with Taxi Driver, Fury Road, Michael Mann's Collateral. But certainly at the time of release, you couldn't drive yourself and, and have failed your test seven times, I believe. What's the update there, Hoss? Can, can the writer of Drive still not himself legally get behind the wheel of a car? No, I, I cannot drive. And, and, and Nick, Nick Raffin, I believe, still can't drive either. But he, he did... He did trump me because I suddenly, I think I told him that I'd failed seven times. And then when I started reading interviews with him after the movie, he failed eight times. <laughs> which I think how competitive he is. There's some one-upmanship going on there. Exactly. Um, I feel like at this point, it's such a nice wrinkle in the legend of this film that, you know, it's almost incumbent upon you not to ever get your license. That's how it feels to me anyways. I don't think I, I, don't think I have much chance to be honest. And there, was, there was a lot of bluffing going on when, when I had to do the research and talk to stunt drivers and things like... <laughs> Like being told to look at the engine and looking in the wrong place and not looking. <laughs> <laughs> and I, don't, I don't think I ever confessed that I couldn't drive until after the film had come out. The film turned 10 last year and it remains such a beloved sort of cult movie, cult thriller. What kind of place does it have in your heart, Hoss? You've obviously been involved in such an eclectic array of projects, many of which, like Drive, were adaptations and often quite tricky adaptations in terms of the source material. How do you reflect back on the film a decade on and the sort of winding road, no pun intended, that it took to get the film to the screen? I mean, what's really lovely about it is the fact that, you know, people are still talking about it because with most films, they're lucky to have, you know, three or four year lifespan. And then, you know, five is pretty good. So the idea that, you know, 10 years later, people are still interested in it is, is, is hugely gratifying. I mean, like all movies, it definitely had its massive ups and downs and, and and highs and lows and and that tends to get 
forgotten if, if a film does well. I still kind of, and particularly with the early, early drafts, I mean, before Ryan came on and Nick came on, it was, you know, it went, it went from, you know, great responses to bad responses to feeling like it would never happen to, you know, suddenly getting a second life and stuff. So the development process is always really difficult. I, I guess I wouldn't know, but it's like, I guess I imagine it's a bit like having a baby, you sort of forget the pain. <laughs> And, you know, the film was a real cultural moment, you know, with so much celebration, especially of the style of the movie on release. And it's understandably so, like, you know, the soundtrack, uh, the really distinct kind of colours, all those teals and pinks that, that Nick filled the movie with. It's a, it's a really beautifully directed movie. It's a really sensory movie. But there's real substance beneath just the visual power of Drive. Yeah, I'd be curious to know, like, what the story and character elements were that you think helped really connect with people. I think what it does have is a sort of almost archetypal core, that story, which is, you know, the stranger who comes in from nowhere, rescues the family and then rides out into the sunset. So whether it's like Shane or, you know, the samurai was a big influence, but I think there's something about awkward, lonely people that I think large members of an audience sort of relate to. And the idea that that person who's underestimated and, sort of people sort of walk past without noticing then turns out to be some almost vengeful superhero i, I think strikes a chord with audiences so i do think there were these the these core i mean joseph campbell writes about it lots of jungian psychi you know and psychology and stuff like that people but there are i think certain stories it almost works like a fairy tale uh and i think that with all the sort of wonderful stuff that that Nick brought to it, you know, do do help elevate it. But but also the original novel, I remember had an absolutely sort of, you know, it was, it was very different because it didn't really have a storyline, but the character was so beautifully drawn and the atmosphere was so completely hypnotic and compelling. Even that had a grip. Um, and, you know, I just think, I think there are some characters that just resonate with audiences. Um, and it doesn't matter how well a script is written. If, if that core story, core character isn't working, then you can write as beautifully as you want. It won't necessarily capture the imagination in the same way. Yeah, I think Nick actually referred to the film as like a modern day grim fairy tale, in, you know, in which like you have this unlikely hero who rises to battle an evil king and save a princess. Um, the quote here I've got says, in the old days, knights would put a sword between themselves and a woman. And in Los Angeles, a man like this exists. Um, did you see the story the same way, Hoss? Like, what were some of the reference points you were kicking around with Nick? I actually spent probably three or four years developing the script with different directors and actors attached before it ever got to Ryan and Nick. I had my references initially, which were those 70s film noirs, and, I, and even the, the 40s and 50s film, film noirs I'd always loved, but you know, uh, Melville, um, the French director, had been a huge influence. And so those were my sort of uh, references. And then when Nick came on, he, he, his, I remember watch. You know, I was we actually sort of. Shared, I lived in his house in LA for a while, and I remember he was watching these incredibly, kind of luridly colourful, sort of exploitation horror movies. And I was just trying to figure out what, what was going through his mind. And then he'd be watching. No, pretty in pink and stuff like that. So there was a whole bunch of eclectic, and I couldn't quite see the connection until I started to see Rushes in the movie and, and realised that, you know, th there was almost like a combination of my 70s influences with 80s influences that he brought to it. And, and I think that took it from being a tough guy, gritty 70s style movie to something more different, surreal, magical maybe. And so at that it, during that last phase of the development where you know, I think the really script really sort of found itself. And that was where Nick and Ryan were both heavily involved and, and all the other actors. That's when those references, like the colours and the, you know, I remember Nick, there's a scene where drivers looking at the gangsters through a window wearing that mask. I mean, the mask was Ryan's idea because I think he'd seen it on YouTube, that shot Nick sort of had in his head. And then it was how to try to make that work. So, so there were quite detailed discussions and then I'd go away and write it. I mean, that's the most fun part of writing a script when everyone is coming in and, and the film is real and it's happening and you're just trying to make it better. And that's very different from those early drafts where you're living with the insecurity of, will this ever work? Will it ever get made? You know, there's constant 
star drops out, director's film doesn't do well, so he's kind of fired. And he went through lots of those those quite sort of ugly processes before it sort of became a go project. It certainly did. And we'll get to those. But it's interesting, Hoss, kind of viewing the film through the lens of, you know, your wider body of work, because, well, you know, I think back to a film like The Two Faces of January, which, you know, you not only wrote, but you also directed. It's a fantastic movie. Around the release of that film, you talked about the way that Patricia Highsmith so often puts us in the shoes of unlikable characters, often criminals, and that makes us not only understand their motivations, but it makes us recognize something of ourselves in them. And, you know, that's a bit of a thread in your work, Drive included. The driver here, you know, we've talked about him being like a sort of fairy tale hero, but there's also a dark side. This isn't a clean cut hero. And yeah, across your work, it seems you're much more compelled by complicated characters, you know, whose endearing traits are kind of matched by some dark ones. Is that kind of fair to say? And, and where do you think that trait in your work comes from, Hoss? I mean, it, it's definitely fair. And I've always just found those characters more interesting because I don't, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's completely good or completely bad. And I do, I do love villains who are very, very human. And there's a, there's a quote, and I can't remember, it's probably not Hitchcock, but it sounds like it would be, but every villain is the hero of their story. And with Bernie Rose, that definitely felt the case in Drive. And I, do, I am drawn to, and, and, and same with, with heroes, the idea of vulnerability and weakness. And I think that's because I, you know, like in your eyes, you, you recognize there are things about yourself you don't like. And I, I certainly think my experience growing up, I guess my parents were going through a divorce. I was Iranian and there was a revolution. So I, I left my country and had to settle somewhere new. So there was, there was quite a lot of darkness kind of going on in that period. Not, not that I had an unhappy childhood particularly, but the, the idea that the world could suddenly change and, and you can't control it and how that sort of influences you and changes you. The idea of comfortable characters just never appealed to me because of that they were always going through some kind of um uh some difficulty some trouble and some inner darkness because i, I do feel that's the human condition i think i think film is either escapist in the sense that it's like let's just forget about that reality or i think it tries to explore that and i think both are really important but i'm definitely drawn to i don't know sounds really pretentious but but the human soul uh, with all its complications and messiness and you know struggle with itself and do you think you gravitated towards storytelling at that early age because in what feel like uncontrollable worlds where things can as you say turn upside down so quickly writing and being in control of your own little world on a page that gives you some sense of of agency and, and control over it right i think that's absolutely right i think that period of chaos sort of meant that I was always drawn to some kind of order. And like you said, writing is a way of controlling and, and, and escaping. And there is definitely, I think, a link between those two things. With storytelling, that idea of just escaping to other worlds and stuff, which is why I love the research part. And even though I couldn't drive with Drive, I remember buying this is a magazine called Muscle Car Magazine and just got obsessed with American cars of that period. And that's part of, I guess, a thing of escaping into your own world and, and, and sort of trying to control it through research and whatever. And so when you do get to the writing of the script, and, and often when I write a script, I don't really tend to watch stuff or read stuff that's not related to the subject that I'm writing about. So, so it's almost a form of method, method writing, I guess. And, and I, I think there is that link of just trying to cocoon yourself and from some kind of childhood trauma, I guess. How about adaptation? How did you end up kind of gravitating towards that? Because that's been such a sort of constant within your well, I, I read a lot. I mean, I, that, I was an obsessive reader. I think that was the same period when all of that was, you know, the turmoil, the, the upheaval was going on. Books were some kind of escape and retreat and, and, and sanity, I guess. And so I remember like reading Lord of the Rings three times or something when I was about 13 or 14. And, and, and I was very nerdy in that sense. So for me, adaptations have always been about that reading experience. So it's really, um, and I kind of think I mentioned this before, but it's, it's that, that, that experience of lying, you know, on a sofa and reading the book and, and finishing it and closing it and all the emotional, intellectual, whatever feelings you have after that. And then the adaptation process is really trying to capture that. And, and, and I think almost more than going through it and going, oh, this works here or this doesn't and being very, you know, it's, it's really trying to capture the emotion of the first read and convey that in the screenplay. 
the book we're talking about here, you know, Drive really was quite lyrical in novel form compared to the film. And obviously this wasn't your first rodeo kind of having to adapt something with a lot of interiority in terms of the character and find a cinematic form for it. Like Wings of the Dove was kind of in that ballpark too, from what I recall. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. yeah. So we daunted by that when you first read Drive, like, uh, or, or because you'd done Wings of the Dove, did you know, okay, I've done this before, I, I can handle this? I, I actually wasn't daunted because in a way with Wings of the Dove, it's, I mean, they're very different movies, but quite similar in the sense that because they were unadaptable, as it were, I mean, they didn't really have storylines and like you said, they're very interior. It was sort of liberating and it meant that I could invent without necessarily being sort of unfaithful or, or disappointing fans of the books and stuff. I mean, the, book, the, the two, the, the books and the adaptations were so different that, that I felt quite liberated. And, and that, that's always really exciting when you can bring a part of yourself to an adaptation. So they almost feel like half original, half adaptations. And I think, I think that's what I, you know, whereas something like Jude the Obscure, when I adapted that, because Thomas Hardy writes in very visual cinematic scenes, you know, what wrote in, you know, it ends up, unfortunately, you, you end up, there's a danger of sort of filleting what's there and it becomes a, a sort of reduced version of the book. Whereas I think yeah. with, with Wings of the Dove and with Drive, I was sort of able to sort of take, you know, go, well, this speaks to me and how about if I invent this scene or that scene? And, and, and both Henry James and, James Salas created such extraordinary characters and atmosphere that I felt really comfortable inventing scenes because they'd sort of given me the groundwork to do that, even though they hadn't necessarily written those same scenes. Um, and, and, and they were probably the two adaptations that I enjoyed the most. So when you talk about bringing a part of yourself to the page in these adaptations, are you referring to the fact you're adding scenes that weren't there or, or are you talking about actual kind of personal parts of your story that you're able to kind of imbue upon a script? Both, I think. I think, I think, I think if you don't bring personal, I mean, I, th I think you can, for example, I think there's ways of bringing in even, whether it's emotional exp experiences, practical experiences, whatever, the, that you can put those in a genre film. I mean, I don't think that's what I, you know, that, that whether it's in a sci-fi movie or a, you know, Western or a thriller if people recognize something of themselves in that moment, and those are the sort of movies I like, which are sort of grounded in that sense. But I think it's really, if, you, if you're not feeling it as a writer and you're not transported to the place where you're writing, then, then I think the writing doesn't tend to be as good. For me, if I, don't, if I don't feel that I can bring something of my emotional life to the script, then I, I'm kind of less interested. So what part of your emotional life do you think you brought to the driver, Hoss, if you don't mind me asking? I was sort of attracted to his, his shyness and a certain way of retreating into a sort of loneliness and that exist, you know, that solitary existence. And that was partly, you know, a love of those kind of characters from movies. But, but again, as I was saying, you know, sort of when I was younger, I was quite shy and stuff like that. And, and, and so that's always stayed with me. And the idea that, you know, for a shy person, that this person could be shy and heroic and violent and sort of dangerous was kind of compelling in a kind of, again, nerdy um, sort of way. So, so it, it was, it was that inability to communicate. And, and I mean, emotionally, not verbally, but I think, I think in his case, it was verbal as well. Yeah. But the idea of feeling very, very strong emotions, but finding it very hard to express those to the person that you feel them for. Uh, and, and that feels very human to me. And, you know, and I've always really enjoyed you know, love stories in the middle of kind of genre structures. So this this had that as well. So Hoss, typically on the show, writers talk about their first drafts being quite different to the finished movie. And, you know, they'll relay how subsequent drafts began to resemble the finished movie more and more. But from what I've read, Drive actually sort of took a different route. It sounds like you actually wrote a first draft that pretty closely resembled the finished film but then as kind of the studio uh, and other other people kind of joined and left the project, you know, you wrote subsequent drafts that then went off in some wildly different directions before, you know, Nick came on board and was like, wait, guys, I think we had this on the first draft. Let's strip back to that, basically. It changed a lot when Nick and Ryan and the actors were all on board. But I would say what, what happened was Ryan came on before Nick. It was originally written for Hugh Jackman. When Hugh Jackman dropped out, Ryan was shown 
I think a later draft of the script in the first draft. And he'd sort of, he read the first draft and said, you know, I think I prefer this one. This one, you know, is, is, is way more interesting than what happened afterwards. So we sort of worked with Nick off the first draft. So that, that, that I think all the subsequent drafts got thrown out. And obviously it evolved a lot through, I think, the six months from when we were greenlit to shooting. But our starting point ironically for that process was the first draft and this had been after three or four years of development <laughs> um, i mean not all of those were active because it sort of there was a year where it was just nothing happened with it but i think there were definitely at least two 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 three drafts that got thrown out completely yeah i think i came across ryan describing the first draft that he read i don't even think the driver was a stuntman in that particular draft so were there different versions of the character and and yeah were there kind of wildly different iterations of what this movie was going to be he was all, always a stuntman, but he wasn't always the race car thing had gone at some stage. At some stage, Irene died um, on one of the drafts. He sort of goes off with the kid. Um, then, then there were, God, I'm trying to think other variations, but it definitely, it, it definitely got softened from the, the first draft was probably closest to the character in the book and not saying very much. Then, you know, obviously, and this always happens in development, notes come that we need more backstory. So that then suddenly he started to say more. And then the idea that let's focus on the kid because the kid gives emotion to the piece. So the idea of, you know, um, which I always hated, but the idea of driver ending up with a kid, because I always felt driver had to be on his own in the end. But there was definitely, we tried that, didn't work. It's amazing how he was a stunt. He was now. I think he was always a stunt driver. But he definitely didn't. We lost the race car driver. I think at some stage he's doing too many things. Was probably the note. How can he, you know? But but although the original pitch had been stunt driver by day, getaway driver by night, and so so I think what happened was stunt driver by day, getaway driver by night, and race car driver just suddenly <laughs> got too much for everyone. <laughs> so so that got stripped away. So how did it shake out with Irene dying? What, what did that version of the story look like? She died. Um, how did she? I can't remember how she died. Um, I, I think she's killed. That's right. I think she she gets killed by the, the kind of Bernie Rose's lot and Driver then goes on the revenge spree. So that that was, I think, how that worked out structurally. Um, yeah. So um, didn't work. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> didn't work. You talked about a process of softening. You can understand the fears that might have circulated around the project at studio level and, you know, what must have been driving all the kind of hand wringing over the projects. Like on one hand, the hook of the novel, Stuntman by Day, Getaway Driver by Night, you know, that just begs to be put on a movie poster. But on the other hand, there was a real darkness to the novel and a violence kind of coursing through this character. Could you understand them wanting to sandpaper that down? And was it up to you to kind of really resist that? Like, how did that all kind of play out? I mean, it wasn't made as a studio film in the end. It was made as an independent. So so I think Universal Universal put it in turnaround and actually were very gracious and allowed, you know, another company to pick it up. I think the only iteration that would have been possible for it as a studio movie would have been get high concept getaway driver by night you know stunt driver by day so i think i think but what i found more interesting wasn't so much the hook of the novel but the atmosphere of it and like you said that the darkness and violence in that character which suddenly gets unleashed and it's very non-traditional studio because i i also remember getting into trouble with the early drafts because there was this sort of you know there, there'd been that three-act structure notion in in Hollywood screenwriting for such a long time. And, 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 and I'd always written this as almost like a two act thing where the first act is slow build character and then almost a roller coaster of just violence and whatever. And it's, it's really those two acts. And obviously we put the, and that, and the opening sequence actually had been there from the very, very beginning, the, the, the big car chase, um, because I sort of felt I needed to tell the reader, the audience, that this was actually going to end up being a, a sort of thriller and a car chase movie. So then that gave me 30 pages to work with character before anything happens. It was kind of an unusual structure. Uh, and and again, you know, that violence and darkness. And, you know, I, and I also think the film's American box office would probably justify Universal going, well, this isn't, you know, I think it was made as a 
15 or 16 million dollar film as opposed to the 40 or 50 million dollar film that would have made any sense to the studio when you were writing to those budgets was there i mean there is so much spectacle in this film in the iteration we have was there more spectacle in those early drafts was there any more no it was it was all no there was no i mean i I think you know that there there was i mean there, there i guess there were longer car chases and car sequences but it it didn't really i don't think it ever quite hit the action beats that they would have necessarily wanted so it definitely struggled within the studio system i think they're always very you know universal is very nice you know nice studio so they're always quite pleasant about the script and quite encouraging but i got the sense very quickly that they weren't going to green light it so that's when i started to sort of despair a bit and i i just didn't know how i could turn it into the kind of movie that they wanted you touched on the first scene there a moment ago and um this scene is entirely your invention it's it's not at all in the book to the best of my knowledge and it's such a masterclass in like establishing who the character is without giving too much away teasing the double life he leads and uh, you know the unknowableness of that character so we begin with him talking into a phone you give me a time and a place i give you a 5 minute window those 5 minutes i'm yours whatever goes down i'm yours minute either side you're on your own This is all taking place in a low-rent apartment in Koreatown, and he has a map of downtown LA spread out on a bed with dozens of different routes marked in pencil. The voice continues, One last thing, you won't be able to reach me at this number again. The driver hangs up his phone, he folds his map of LA and slips it in a duffel bag. A few clothes and other essentials are neatly packed inside. He zips the bag shut and takes one last look at a cheap TV set. The Clippers are taking a pounding from the New York Knicks. From there, it's practically a silent film for the next, you know, seven minutes or something. Can you talk to me about the construction of this whole sequence, the payoff of the, uh, you know, of of wondering why he's so fixated on the Clippers game? And yeah, what you wanted to achieve in terms of this opening scene, and you touched on it there, like allowing you to then have the following scenes be all kind of character work, all kind of introducing the romantic element of the movie. It's like the map, I'd forgotten about the map, but the map came because I... As someone who doesn't know LA, I had all these maps of LA. So literally when I was writing the script, I was I was tracing routes and stuff for him to kind of, you know, my head just helped me in my head to that he's going from this place to that place. And when I was in LA getting notes and stuff, but you know, they they kindly provided me with a car. He took me around those routes and stuff. So it's literally that was all. And 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 the idea was um you know, I do think with action sequences, they need a story. I hate, I, I get lost in action when I can't follow an action storyline. So, so all those beats, I mean, so I worked out all the beats of, okay, heist goes down, they escape, helicopter. And, and actually a lot of this came from a conversation I had with a, the security expert at, um, at Universal. He was head of security, but I remember going in with, with Adam Siegel, who was our producer and, and, Quite depressingly, he said, there's no way, you know, getaway drivers would get away now because of police helicopters. So we, we sort of, Adam and I went away kind of completely disheartened and then thought, well, you know, police helicopters can't see through roofs. So the whole idea was, you know, so in a way we worked backwards. So the plan was he needs to get to the staple center uh, where he's covered and the crowd is emerging and he can get lost and switch cars and all of that. So from there, it was almost working backwards. That's where the idea of the basketball game that you don't really know until it pays off is set up at the beginning. And also there was something about the silence and the radio and the basketball going on. The police radio and the basketball allowed you to tell that story. But then then I also, so I think in the script, they talk about there's, there's a reference to a police car passing like a shark or something, uh, and then it's gone. And, and I think, so those were all, those beats were all there. And then the hiding under the tunnel, so, so, so it's sort of it was really structured with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the the police car when they suddenly face each other in the. So it's I think it's a six or seven page. And it's quite a long section of blocks of description, yeah, as with, with no dialogue. But I, I, I sort of feel for me that's how action sequences look, and the, and the director can come and change everything, and quite often they do. And the stunt people say, well, let's do this and this instead. But I still think. For the read, you need 
I don't, I, I don't write the kind of script to say, then there's a car chase. I mean, I need, <laughs> I need to, if it's a 10 minute car chase, it needs to be 10 minutes on the page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 10 pages, if you're taking a page a minute or whatever, uh, then you really, I think, need to think those things out. Yeah, it's so fitting that the film utilises the Staples Centre this way because, you know, that's a major L.A. location. This is a quintessential L.A. movie, like the endlessness and sprawl of that city is there on the page. Did you set out with that intention, Hoss, to kind of capture a little bit of the city's personality? It's interesting with the basketball thing, I instantly, I mean, that's where uh, Adam Siegel, our producer, was saying, because I, I had naturally, as a as an outsider, I had, you know, it was the LA Raiders, not the, you know, that he he just suggested, you know, put the Clippers in all the names of the players and and whatever. He he was very helpful in terms of the LA of it all, and and also it was just, it was really, you know, I, th- there is an LA that also exists in movies, so both Nick and I were borrowing from that quite a lot, and and then like I said, I had my little roadmap of, you know, the the. So I, I did do a lot of actual on the spot research where, you know, and then we didn't use up using, you know, the same bank or pawn shop where the, the heist goes down, but I would go and, you know, get driven miles away to kind of go and study, you know, the parking lot of this place and the whatever of that place and try to picture it in my head just so I had a feel for the places I was describing and the action was taking place in. The scorpion jacket that the driver wears throughout the film and that Nick you know, really punctuates the movie with, with lingering shots of throughout. Like, I don't know if that was written into the screenplay. I sort of didn't see it on the page. Can you tell me how that yeah. came to be and, and what you saw as being the significance of the scorpion? Well, I think that's that's the brilliant stuff about, you know, how films actually turn from something kind of two-dimensional on the page to something three-dimensional when they're shot. And I, I think it was the costume designer who came up with that. And I think Ryan then had the idea for the scorpion and the frog um story so that you know that's that's the thing that all these things evolve sort of organically and i think what i loved about nick as a director was that he was really open to everyone's influence so so for example most a lot of directors i i'd work with were really uncomfortable are uncomfortable with writers being around actors whereas nick was okay the actors need to really have a go at telling you, giving you their notes and stuff. So I, and it, sometimes it was really brutal. There'd, there'd be all sorts of actors' notes, which I found incredibly helpful. But likewise, he would take from a costume designer's idea and make it an iconic part of the storytelling. Or it may have been a Kenneth Anger reference. I can't remember um, if, where, if it was Nick's Kenneth kind of Anger. But there was something about how it then evolved into the story of the scorpion and the frog and stuff. So it sort of grew like that. I don't know if I'm my favorite with the uh, story of the scorpion and the frog. Is that a fairy tale? I think it's a fable about, you know, about people's nature. I think he's crossing the river and stuff. And then something where he stings him and he goes, it's his nature. There's something about, you know, that even though they have a deal and whatever, he turns around and still kind of, um, you know, stings it and he just can't change. And I think that was that was the, the notion of that. I, that probably applies more to Bernie Rose than it does to Driver. Well, the two, like any sort of great protagonist, antagonist, there's a sort of mirror effect between the two, right? Did you construct Bernie Rose as like his opposite or a sort of reflection of Driver? Like, how did that character come to be? Bernie Rose is really good in the book as well. I mean, that was, that was, that was you know, he was one of the reasons I actually really loved doing the adaptation because Bernie Rose and Nico, so they, they didn't really appear until very late in the novel. There was something really melancholy about Bernie Rose and this idea of, just these these two mobsters who were sort of out of favor with the New York mob, I think, and they're, they're just you know that 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 quote about the every hero is the villain, every villain is the hero of their story. It just felt they were they had this sort of quite touching friendship and and you know protecting each other and you know deep friendship despite their kind of and 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 Bernie was articulate and he was funny and intelligent and, and dry, but was completely monosyllabic. So that, that, that I sort of got the sense that Bernie doesn't like killing people unless he has to, but then he has his collection of knives. Bernie is very beautifully drawn in the book. Obviously a lot of this was in the book, but you know, it's kind of in keeping with what we were talking about earlier of like you constantly looking for sort of like the mess in the very human lives of your characters. 
Have you got a process for uh, trying to find those complications? Because, you know, from a story perspective, this plot works out the same way if Bernie is like a, uh, y- you know, he's the mob boss and there isn't that complicating layer of he's out of favor. Yeah. You know, so so what's your process for kind of adding those layers, adding that depth? Well, like I said, it was it was sort of in there in the book and it was something that I responded to. So I sort of expanded on the character yeah. and on, on that friendship and brought him into this story much, much earlier. And, you know, the Shannon character doesn't, is a, a, an amalgamation of two characters from the book. And, you know, the idea that his friendship with Bernie Rose was again something. So all those layers were trying to, how, how do I take this wonderful character who only appears really at the end of the book and actually sort of make him, you know, the antagonist throughout the story. But but I had the advantage of, you know, just from the two or three scenes that James Salas had written with him, I kind of knew that guy so well that I could put him in any situation and, and he's a talker. And so it was, you know, it was quite, you know, it was quite fun to write someone. You got this sort of nodding, really monosyllabic driver in this guy, just, you know, 10 line dialogue um, passages and stuff like that. Is it hard to write a romance with a character who is so monosyllabic and non-expressive? Like, as it happens, you know, the romance between Driver and Irene, played, of course, by Carrie Mulligan, you know, there's a kind of real less is more approach. It's all in the glances and their movements around each other rather than words. It was always less is more in the script, and then it became even less is more in, uh, in, in <laughs> when they got on set. And it's like, as Wings the Dub is very, very sort of... Every nothing is really spoken in that script as well. And I think again, it's because the characters and the situations from the books that I adapted from from were so powerful that people really didn't need to say very much. The idea of their situations made it very difficult for them to be together. You feel that that longing and desire, but they can't express it or even rec- you know acknowledge it. So that becomes really powerful. And I always find that kind of silent storytelling where I, I don't, I don't, you know, there, there's a school of dialogue, you know, whether it's Tarantino or Sorkin, where the dialogue is the art. Yeah. Um, and for me, the kind of writing I love going back to those very spare thrillers of the whatever is, is when what's not said is really the dialogue and actually the dialogue is just throw away and fairly mundane so there are no there are no real zingers i'd say <laughs> dialogue zingers i think is the term for it in that script you know and and the only person who i mean there was a line about having bernie rose the dirt on my hands sort of thing but that was bernie rose was the only character i could allow to have interesting slightly elevated lines and you know that 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 sort of um because everyone else sort of had to talk awkwardly and i think nick nick directed them beautifully and the actors performed them really because they're, they're just and they they both have amazing you know the, the camera just loves both ryan and carrie mulligan so it can linger on them for, for ages and i think you still kind of feel what's going on behind the eyes and i don't think not every actor can do that so some actors will tell you i don't need to say that line and you go great and others will say, I, I don't need to say that line. You go, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the degree to which like archetypes just take over. Like I was rewatching The Matrix recently and I realized pretty similar to Drive. Like you don't need to see Neo and Trinity kind of express things to each other. No, but, but actually really in a script, you can't do that yeah. because scripts are meant for reading. And so, especially when you're writing a script for the studio, the idea that they don't say anything. I mean, if, if you actually did a, tra- you know, the transcription of that script, that final, sh- you know, what the film looked like, and you put it, turn that into the script and you put it in front of Universal for a first draft, I would have been fired in a second, I think. I mean, I want to say, you know, that's the thing is it's, I think you can only start to cut and pair back and stuff once the script has a green light because, you know, the truth is, I think final shooting scripts are quite ugly pieces of writing because everything's been rewritten for production and scenes are cut and other scenes are put together. So as a read, it's not particularly elegant or snappy. But, you know, the restraint that we just talked about with, in terms of the relationship, that's kind of current throughout the film at large. Like, you know, um, there are lots of parts of Drive which other screenwriters, other filmmakers certainly studios would kind of have felt obliged to fill in. We know enough about Bernie Rose and his criminal empire to like, you know, to get by, but we're not shown everything. 
likewise, you know, we not we know enough about the driver to understand what he's doing without necessarily the motivations. Did you give in to any of those requests at various points in the writing process where you were being asked to, you know, fill in why Gosling's yeah. character was involved in crime, how he ended up in the world, in that world? Like what, what were some of the avenues you explored with all that? The book actually has a has quite a lot of backstory. So I, I actually in later I did you know, use some of that backstory from the book, not as flashbacks, but he would talk about it. But at the moment he talked too much and you learned too much, the character just became less interesting. And, and, and Shane was always the model for me, the Western, because you really don't know very much about him. Um, and you don't really know very much about the villain who um, I think Jack Palance plays, where he's just got a name and he's that name, sort of, I can't remember what the name is in the Western, but it has a, Sort of has a sort of slightly he has a he has a reputation and and that sort of was enough and so that was always my ideal you know way of how to tell this story but but i get of course i gave in because i'm being high and paid and <laughs> you know and you're always living with a threat of being replaced and rewritten um especially when it's a studio level movie so so yeah i did and it's always worth trying stuff you know and and, and mark platt um who's a brilliant producer and adam our producers they were smart and powerful enough um, to to kind of go, well, this isn't working. We always would sort of pull back from that. But yeah, there are definitely drafts of that where Driver talks a lot more than he does in, you know, either the first draft or the final draft. And we should talk, Hoss, about the elevator scene, which is, you know, one of the most iconic of the movie. And, you know, but by this point in the film, we've already seen uh, Driver's brutal side in, in both the strip club scene and in his interrogation of Blanche, which is quite uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. But the abruptness here, I think of his his transformation from tenderness, kissing Irene, to just violent protector, stomping to death that assailant who had drawn a gun on them or was about to draw a gun on them. I'd be really curious to hear how this scene came to be and whether there was anything you wanted to express about the character or even the culture of men like that by by writing in that abrupt, abrupt change. That scene really happened because of they ran out of time, I think, when they were shooting. So it was actually initially two scenes. So there was a scene where he stomped someone in an elevator. But the Irene scene, I think, as was written originally, he's they're going down in the elevator as they do. There's the guy who's with them. Driver begins to sense that he's a menace, but a lot of the action took place after the doors opened. Irene still saw what happened and the blood and the whatever, and then the elevator doors closed and that was that was their parting. But I think that's, you know, I wasn't there on, on the day, but I think Nick's genius was kind of, oh, we're running out of time or we can't, we've got less days than we thought. Why don't we have the stomping in the elevator itself and merge those two scenes and have the kiss? So that I thought was was absolutely kind of, you know, absolutely brilliant. And, and um, you know, it, it, it's what I love about filmmaking is those accidents on the day. I mean, if we'd have had an extra day to shoot or two days to shoot, then those would have been two separate scenes or we would have had you know, a shootout on in the parking lot or a fight in the parking lot, which wouldn't yeah. nearly as powerful as everything that happened in the, <laughs> you know, the closed confined space of the uh, the elevator. But I think emotionally for me, which was always in the script, was that sense that it's the first time Irene sees the violence in Driver and, and Driver can't understand why she doesn't still love him. And that was really interesting to me, the idea that, he's almost so detached from real life that the notion that, hold on, I've just protected you. I said, I've just, you know, I did this for you and, and she's, I don't want this. And I found that, I remember, I can't remember if that was from the novel or where I got it from or how it came to me, but it was definitely something I felt very, very, that idea that actually in the moment where he's, is in a way being his most romantic and heroic, he's also his most repellent to her or frightening to her, not repellent. Yeah, I, I think I read Ryan talking about interpreting that moment as, you know, this is a guy who's, he works as a stuntman and he's almost watched too many Hollywood films and he's bought into a certain perception of like the male hero being prone to this kind of violence yeah. and it, it's normalised upon him. But 
of course, to, to Irene, it's, it's pretty shocking. I, I think for me, it was more internal. I have to say, I, I, it wasn't, you know, the, the, I don't know, I'd always felt, and I felt this is from the book that the violence was inside him, not something that he'd borrowed from somewhere else or seen films or whatever. But yeah, I can see that. I can see that makes sense that, that an actor would need something more concrete, I guess. And of course, the ending, Hoss, you know, there's, there's a purposeful ambiguity over the ending. What was your interpretation, if, if you're comfortable sharing? It's been read in this multitude of ways. I'd be really interested to hear if there, there were kind of many iterations for the ending as you kind of searched for the way to end this story and uh, with the one you ended up, sort of what the intention was. Well, I remember in that first draft, actually, the ending was, and actually quite through quite a lot of the drafts, the ending kind of stayed the same, um, which was... He's he's been stabbed and he's wounded. He's in the car, and there's this idea that that he was dead. That you think he's dead, um, and then and I remember I think in the first chapter it's quite a long sort of again descriptive thing about how the eyes close and whatever, and it's time passes, you know, whatever. But the stillness, 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 and then suddenly the eyes open, and it always ended on him starting the car. So that was there wasn't the drive through. LA in the streets and her waiting. So I think, I think that some of that came, I think Nick originally shot it and edited it like that. And then I think they played around with it in the editing. So may, maybe it was a slightly less abrupt um, sort of whatever ending in the final film. But I always love the idea that you think he's dead and he opens his eyes. And I think that's still there. And that's really one of the things um, you know, that I certainly was left with when I, when I watched it. And inevitably, after the film was so successful, there were people at the studio clamouring for a sequel, according to, uh, to what Nicholas has said before. Was that something you'd like to have been involved in? Or, you know, d- did you feel like this story had been told by that point? No, I, I wouldn't. I, 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 I struggled to, I, I find it very hard to be in, you know, in, especially now, with, even with TV, I've really found it hard to go back to a show that I've already worked on. I just, I, just, I don't know whether it's boredom or, but I, I sort of didn't know what that story would be. Um, there, was, there was a book, uh, James Silas had re- written a sequel and they talked about doing it as a TV show and stuff. I, I just, I think the mystery of that character, I think the moment you do a second thing, he becomes, I mean, the only equivalent, I guess, that did work was the, the you know, the, um, the Clint Eastwood trilogy with, you know, the man with no name. Um, but even then by, by the time you get to the good, the bad and the ugly, it's a different story. Um, you know, he, he sort of, I, I think the enigma, when you do a second one, it inevitably the enigma disappears. And I think it becomes closer to real life than a fairy tale because, it, you know, it's not a once told story. It's, it's suddenly, oh, well, here he is again. And where is he now? And there's a new situation and whatever. So I, I was... Um, I, I was never asked or interested, to be honest, in doing it as a sequel. How strange was the aftermath for you when, well, presumably, you know, you were getting into cabs and they were playing songs from the soundtrack, you know, Drive was everywhere. Was it a strange time for you having, you know, uh, I don't want to make any presumptions, Hoss, but, you know, this would have been the biggest hit of your career by this point, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was a cult, you know, it certainly it's not the script I've worked on that's had the biggest box office or anything like that, but it definitely had, it was, it was certainly the one in terms of fest, film festival recognition and Wings of the Dove had gone to the Oscars and this didn't get, I think it got one, it got kind of fairly overlooked in the Oscars and stuff, but, but it was definitely the one that had that film festival critical love and stuff like that. So that was, that was really gratifying, particularly because it had been so close to just being decimated um, and I, I'd worked on two or three films that I thought were potentially really, really good films that then got destroyed in the editing room by the studio, by different studio interference and whatever. And I think Drive was perilously close to that at one stage. Um, and so the relief, I remember, I think Nick snuck it to the, you know, the the festival at Cannes. And it once it got selected, I think it was hard for the financiers to touch it at that point, but, um, but it could have gone through. I mean, it, it was, it was a sort of film that I'm sure would, would have tested horribly uh, with a test audience. So, and then would have been ripped to pieces and, you know, 
the music would have been changed and, and all that. So it's, I just dread to think what happens. So, so with, actually with all movies, there's almost more sense of relief than there is <laughs> sort of massive satisfaction uh, at the time. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and there's also inevitably you want another one. So that there's, there's almost, it's a little bit of a sort of wait. You can, you can make a movie and a, a, two movies can be exactly the same and one, you know, in terms of their quality or whatever, but one can just touch an audience in a way that you could never have predicted. And another one absolutely is lost on them. And and that's out of your control. So it's, um, but, but it, it, it was definitely, you know, the script I remember being the, one of the hardest I've had to, you know, in the sense of how many drafts and how different and how long that development process was. So it doesn't now make me think that you have to kind of suffer for something to turn out well. And, um, you know, that th- it takes a lot of drafts for a script to get to the right place. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny. I mean, this was a movie which, you know, you and your producers fought really hard to protect the darkness of the story that you and this, the sort of atmosphere that you saw as being kind of requisite of telling the driver's story. A decade on Hoss, it sounds like you're you're still kind of fighting those battles to an extent and trying to convince powers that be that a little darkness is compelling. Audiences will come along for the ride and have a richer experience because of that darkness. Like, you know, some some details recently leaked about the Obi-Wan Kenobi series that you'd written some scripts for and uh, that were deemed a little too dark for Disney, according to these reports, who wanted to kind of go for something more hopeful. Can you talk to me at all about that experience, Hoss, and uh, yeah, what your vision had been for that show? The, the vision, I mean, I, I can just about what the things that interested me at the time, which were, you know, that Obi-Wan in that particular time and place. And, you know, the idea, and I think, I think a lot of that's probably still there, that the, the idea of um, all his friends have died, his, what he believed in has fallen and, um, you know, and, and he's lost his faith in a sense. He's lost his, not in the force, but some sense of, um, and, and, and from what I see in the trailer, that notion is still there and, and, uh, and my name is still on some of the scripts, even though lots of other writers now. Um, but, but I think that idea of, again, someone having to work, you know, and, 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 and the thing that inspired me when I read it was, this is, this is where it's probably, this is probably why I got fired. <laughs> I remember like, I think it was a little bit like the, the book of Job where he, he needs to go through tests and, 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 you know, and that idea that you go through tests and you then at the end of it, you find your faith. And that, that for me is quite a dark journey, but it's one that ends up kind of in a hopeful place. Um, but, but, you know, look, I, I think I'm naturally drawn to, like I said, those sort of things. And I think, I think maybe one of the strengths of, of, of Star Wars is its simplicity. So, um, I don't know what else to say about that. Really. <laughs> was it true Darth Maul was involved? Was that those reports on the money? Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't think that was that was ever. Um, no, not certainly not. Uh, I mean, God, I mean, it's such. It's such. A, it goes back such a long way, and there's been so many cartoons and yeah. stuff. But, but certainly in in the the discussions I'd had, there was never any any real mention of that. So what have you been working on, uh, you know, in the meantime, since then, Hoss? Like, you know, th- there's a few kind of projects you're attached to on. They're all quite dark, actually. <laughs> the few that I've been working on this year. It's, it's a dark terrible. time. One is, one is, yeah, one is, um, is what happened to the, there's a TV show that I work on, which is what happened to the, the mutineers on the bounty afterwards, really. It concentrates on Pitcairn Island and, and, that the, it's almost like Lord of the Flies for adults and, and how that society fell apart and, and all those things of civilization and savagery and stuff. So that's wow. quite very my heart of darkness and Lord of the Flies. And then I was sort of writing a, uh, a Western, which has got supernatural elements, but is very, um, again, it's quite dark and gory. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't, I don't know why I go back to that. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I would sort of, you know, there's there's something about. I mean, Cormac McCarthy is one of my favourite authors, yeah, and I just re rereading Blood Meridian, and you know, it's horrendous, but I just find it so utterly sort of extraordinary. I mean, it's just such an incredible piece of writing. You're a braver man than me, revisiting Blood Meridian in this weather at this time with everything going on in the world. No, I was, I was, I was reading a passage to my 
my 16 year old son. And I thought there's something wrong with me. That I'm like, it was this amazing passage where I think the, um, I can't remember it's Comanche's attack and they're all dressed in sort of wedding gown veils and dragoons sort of, you know, bloodstained thing and whatever, but it's just the most, just honestly the most wonderful piece of racing. Like, and it just, I'd read it, God knows, 20 something years ago and I reread it and it was just, just as good as I remembered. Is McCarthy one of the, just in terms of someone who's adapted so many great books by so many great authors, is he one of the, one of the authors who is left on the list of, of people you'd love to adapt or who would be in the mix for you? I don't know. Cause I actually think he's really hard to adapt because I think so much this, the, the writing and the actual, the, the style is such an important part of his, his storytelling and his atmosphere. And, and the thing with Blood Meridian, for example, is it's, it's that sort of biblical apocalyptic language. It's and and how do you get that in a movie? So I think he's very hard to adapt. I mean, the, there was another book that I always loved and it got, it got adapted uh, which was J- James Elroy's Black Dahlia, yeah, yeah, yeah. which weirdly I think would would have made a better TV series than than it did a movie because it's all about the passage of time and and obsession. And I think that those themes work really well in you know in TV because that allows you more time. But then I think Zodiac captured exactly that that sensation brilliantly. So maybe it's already been done. <laughs> Excellent. Well. Hoss, this has been so much fun, man. Thank you so much for coming on Script Apart. I'm looking forward to everything you've got coming up. Come back anytime. It's been a blast. Thank you. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. 